Well, despite their strained relationship with the Canadian government, cultural barriers and limited civil rights, thousands of Aboriginal Canadians fought in the Great War. Author Joseph Boyden writes of some of what those soldiers saw in his 2005 novel called Three Day Road. And Joseph Boyden joins us now from New Orleans, Louisiana, to tell us more about the role of First Nations during the First World War. Hi, welcome back to the Agenda in the Summer. Hi, how are you? I'm really good. I, I want to begin with the personal connection. Many Canadians have a personal connection to the Great War. You do as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, my, a lot of my family on both sides uh, were involved in the First World War. My <clears throat> father's oldest brother, actually, my uncle Earl, was an uh, a infantry, uh, uh, infantry man in the First World War. Um, my mother's father uh, was a motorcycle dispatch rider in the Great War. He was actually wounded on November 11, 1918 while delivering news, and I'm assuming it must have been news of the armistice. He, he, uh, he was blown off his motorcycle and lost his eye. Um, uh, my great aunt uh, was a nurse in the, in the, in the, just behind the lines in the First World War as well. So I have all these different kind of family connections to, to an event that took place 100 years ago. Mm. Your novel, uh, Three Day Road, explores the journey of two Aboriginal soldiers in the trenches uh, of Europe. How much exposure do Canadians have to, have to Aboriginal participation in World War I? Well, you know, before my book came out, I don't think much at all. Um, I was actually shocked by my research over the years, uh, having thought I understood the history, um, really realizing how many men volunteered and at what great cost, especially by, to a country that had treated them so horrendously for the last, uh, for decades and decades. Um, so I don't think a lot. I think more and more now, which is really happy. And I'm not saying that Three Day Road has done that alone, but I think that it has helped to um, shine a light on a kind of a darker corner of our history. Mm. We, you know, I, I said in the introduction there that thousands of Aboriginal Canadians went and fought in, in the Great War. What are the, the numbers? I can't, I can't seem to nail these down, Joseph. I'm having a hard time nailing them down too. And this is, you know, I, I started researching this in the late 90s. Uh, I've heard different stories from different people, but yes, it was thousands. And I've gone out up and, you know, talked to different community members uh, across Canada, different reserves. And the stories are often that all el eligible aged men uh, the reserve was empty of them because they had all gone off to join the war and to, uh, uh, for whatever reason that they did personally. Um, uh, so it was, it was many thousands. One thing is for sure is that the Canadian uh, government was so shocked and surprised by the sheer numbers of Indian volunteers uh, early in the war that they considered and almost created uh, their own uh, First Nations infantry, um, um, their own uh, regiment. Uh, um, uh, bigger than a regiment actually but for fear number one that there were so many coming in at the same time but also they were not they weren't sure that the native people were going to get along with white people well, which is really interesting it, it's astounding actually the numbers some thousands of them uh, that yeah. went to fight given that um, aboriginal canadians they weren't even considered canadian citizens at the time but no they the, weren't but, citizens they couldn't vote they couldn't own land they couldn't yeah, yeah. they could they couldn't Wards they didn't the have state. much stake in, in Canada, if I could put it that, or weren't allowed to. And, yeah. and yet, and they're exempt from conscription. So, I mean, why were Aboriginal Canadians signing up to go fight a war for, for people that really didn't respect them, arguably, at the time, and, and for a war that really had nothing to do with them? Well, this is one of the things I had to uh, come to terms with as I wrote Three Day Road so long ago. It feels like a lifetime ago now. <laughs> um, but this is one of the things I had to figure out. I was like, why would they? And so I went out and asked, you know, there's nothing, there wasn't much written about why, you know. And so I asked different people, I asked different elders, and, you know, one would say, well, why does any young man go off to fight a war? It's for the sense of adventure. It's for the, the, the security of getting a regular paycheck. It's to, uh, it's, it's the chance to go off and see a different part of the world you've never seen before. You know, the whole kind of... Uh, horn blowing at the beginning of World War One was it's going to be over by Christmas jump on now or you're going to miss out on all the fun you know it was literally that kind of talk and so many young men regardless of culture uh, ran to enlist for just that reason that adventure the romanticism of, of you know the 18th the 19th century style of warfare men on horseback and gallantly riding across the the plains um, and lo and behold when they showed up it was a very different war than that um, but I, I knew it had to be more than that for First Nations men. And uh, I dug deeper and asked around and asked around. And, and one elder said to me at one point, you know, think about it. Our culture had been taken away. Our children were literally taken away from us. We weren't allowed to speak our language. Um, our kids were thrown into residential schools. Uh, we couldn't practice our religion. We couldn't dance. We couldn't do any of these things. And as a young man, imagine how you would feel emasculated. You would feel like everything had been taken away from you. 
Um, and so how do you reclaim that warrior spirit, that sense of, of warrior spirit? You go off and you prove yourself in battle. And so uh, uh, I think that was a, a little bit of a deeper reason. And then one other elder was very funny. He's this very funny guy. He's always making me laugh. And he said, well, imagine it. If you know, they're going to pay me to kill white guys, yeah, I'm going <laughs> yeah, to, I'll, 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 I'll take that job. Uh, but there was many different reasons. And sometimes even there was lying going on. The, um, the person running the reserve, the uh, person in charge, uh, the government agent uh, would say that you have to go or you lose your, uh, your treaty money. Yeah. And so this happened as well too. But for the most part, it was, I think, to reclaim that, 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 that sense of, uh, uh, of pride, to reclaim their, their masculinity. And, that, and that, that seems to make the most sense to me. You, you know, you, you repeated the joke about going over to kill the white guy, sign me up thing. But the, Aboriginal Canadians were also fighting alongside white guys. What was the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians in the, in the trenches of Europe? Everything I've heard was it was brilliant. You know, the government was very concerned, as I mentioned, that Indian people would not get along with white people, that their laziness might rub off on the white people, that their, their strange ways and customs might uh, offend or, 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 or concern uh, white troops. But if you hear, you know, every story I've ever heard, whether it was Henry Norwest being the darling of his regiment, John Shewak, the great uh, Inuit sniper, you know, Norwest was a Métis sniper. Uh, John Shewak, uh, the great Inuit sniper, killed in 1917, um, was beloved by his regiment. Francis Pegamagabo, they couldn't pronounce the name Pegamagabo, the Ojibwe name, and so they called him Peggy. And again, he was the darling of the regiment. Uh, um, so it, it was typically very brilliant. Uh, mm. People really looked up to, especially to the, to the First Nations men who had those uh, certain skill sets uh, that made them into great snipers. Of the 10 greatest snipers in the First World War I've read, out of all of the armies, three were Canadian Indians. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Pegamagabo, Peggy, uh, in just a minute. But, and, and you listed a, a few Aboriginal Canadians who, who were lauded and celebrated for how good they were in battle. Overall, how effective were Aboriginal Canadians on the battlefields as soldiers, as fighters? Uh, again, there's no, there's no one specific documentation was so poor that, for example, Francis Pegamagabo uh, was awarded the uh, military uh, medal twice. Uh, and, and the second time they didn't even document how he was awarded it. And so, so documentation uh, w is very slight, um, uh, but it's usually the great names that stand out, you know, the snipers, the, the, the scouts, the, the, the ones who, who were really adept in, in their field. Mm. It almost grew to a, a, um, a status of, 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 of godliness almost um, in their regiments. But then there was just the average First Nations fella who was just like his neighbor right beside him, white neighbor or whomever it might be, who was just a, a, a grunt in the trenches who had to put up and, and deal with uh, the horrors that everyone else did and, and did his job admirably. Were those um, soldiers who, who were good enough, I can put it that way, to move up the ranks, Aboriginal soldiers, were they allowed to move up the ranks? They were fighting in, a, in an army of the colonizer. It, it took a while, but yeah, Francis Pegamagabo was made into uh, a corporal. Uh, Shewak was made into a corporal. You notice they didn't rise above corporal. Um, I think, you know, Pegamagabo supposedly had 378 German kills. Uh, if he was American and white, he would have been as big as John Wayne. Mm. Um, he would have been a, a colonel. He would have been a, he would have been a, a greatly lauded and never forgotten in our, in our, in our country. Um, and so to a certain degree, they rose up the ranks. But for what Pegamagabo did, uh, the military medal uh, is with two bars, actually, so three times, um, is, is, is quite the feat. But I can't help but wonder if he was uh, uh, white, uh, mm. if he had not been given a much higher uh, um, a medal. But again, this is all conjecture on my part, but I think it's conjecture worth, uh, worth considering. Well, you, you talked about why, um, sort of uh, more broad, broadly, why some Aboriginal Canadians decided to go fight the war. Did, did, did Pegamagabo have a specific reason why he wanted to go and serve in the military? Well, he was a real adventurer. He was a really fascinating, complex character. He, 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 he was in a brass band uh, up in Perry Sound. You know, he, he was a member and he played uh, uh, you know, the brass instrument. I'm not even sure which one. I think it might have been cornet. Mm. Um, uh, he was also a woodsman. He was a logger. He, uh, he was um, a great shot, obviously, a great trapper and hunter. Um, but he was really had that kind of flair about him where he was also, you know, he was very natally dressed man. He, he, he 
was a charmer. He was a very, very handsome dude. Uh, he, he really had that spirit, that kind of joie de vivre that, that, uh, of the time period. He really had it nailed down. And I think, you know, he went in part for the sense of adventure for sure, but also to prove himself. So many, you know, think of, you know, I, I, I've had to put myself in the position of trying to imagine what it would have been like uh, when I wrote Three Day Road for, for a First Nations man to go and why he would go. And it would be that, that deeply kind of driven desire to say, listen, I'm, I'm as worthy as you are. You know, just because I'm a ward of the state, you call me a ward of the state and I'm not allowed to own property. I can't vote. If I leave the reserve, I'm punished. Uh, I'm, I'm every bit as good as you are, maybe better, and, mm. and I'm going to prove that. And I, you know, I think that was, a, that was a big thing for a lot of, uh, of young men to do. You talked about uh, when he comes home from battle, he's recognized to some extent militarily. How, but how is he treated amongst his home community when he returns from battle? Well, there's the, the general public. Uh, you know, he was the most highly decorated First Nations uh, uh, soldier of the First World War, and very highly decorated regardless. Um, uh, when he came home, there was a parade held for him in Toronto, and then he was sent home to the reserve. And the Indian, you know, Francis decided, you know, like many young men, he must have been very tortured and, and, and quietly suffering from what he had experienced. Keep in mind, he, he was overseas for almost the whole war and survived in the most dangerous possible job you could have overseas. Nor, neither Norwest nor Shewak uh, uh, made it home. Uh, in their job as sniper, but Francis managed to not just survive but to flourish uh, in his in his position. But I imagine, like many other young men, he came home and it was not an easy time for him. Mm. Um, he he, one story uh, that has been documented is he decided, you know what, I, he kind of fell in love with the horses when he was when he was overseas, and he decided he wanted to take his hand at, at raising horses on Perry Island and Wasoxing Reserve. And so he went to the Indian agent. You had to do this. He had to go to the Indian agent to ask permission for anything. He went and said, I would like to take a small loan from you. And the Indian agent said, what for? And he said, uh, to, I'd like to try to raise horses. And the Indian agent literally looked at him and said, how could I trust someone like you with live animals? Uh, there's no way I'm going to give you a loan for, for horses. Uh, that's absurd. And so this is, you know, the greatest... Um, the most highly decorated officer or uh, uh, infantryman in, in, in World War I as a First Nations person being treated this way by an Indian agent. You can imagine how other First Nations returning home were treated. And also keep in mind too, the Canadian government made a lot of promises to First Nations men if they were to join the army. We will uh, give you land, we'll give you fair education like everyone else, uh, we'll give you your freedom basically. You will no longer be a ward of the state. I don't know if a lot of Canadians know, but it wasn't until the 1960s that, that First Nations were allowed to vote in our mm. country. So, so those uh, promises were obviously not kept. One of the um, things that was going on as, as young Aboriginal Canadian men head, head off to war, of course, is, is residential schools mm. in, in Canada. How much effect did that experience have as young men headed off to, to war in Europe? Their residential school experience? Yes. Mm. Let's see again. This is conjecture on my part. Um, I uh, I would imagine you know you have to keep in mind the residential school system. You're taken about the age four or five or six away from your family and not allowed to see them uh, for months, if not years, at a time. You were not allowed to, typically to again speak your language, eat your food, practice your religion um, or your customs. Uh, so they're basically tried to be uh, made into little versions of us, you know, of of the white culture. Um, so that would have been very difficult. And then you were just let go at about the age of 14 to 16. Off to the world, off you go. Uh, with no, you know, that's it. Mm. And so there's a lot of confusion, I think, for a lot of people for a very long time. And so to take that kind of experience into the First World War, I would think of it as being a very kind of confused situation for a lot of young men, not really understanding who they were. Mm. And that kind of confusion, uh, um, you know, can lead to a lot of trauma. Um, Three Day Road focuses on, on two soldiers um, who go off to, to, to war. Xavier is Cree, has trouble speaking English. Was that a true representation, the, the, the significant language barrier between Aboriginal soldiers and non-Aboriginal so, soldiers in the Canadian Army? It was certainly part of the experience. Uh, you know, again, I did a lot of research for this novel, obviously, and there, many young men would paddle hundreds of miles to the closest training post in order to uh, join the army and go off and they did not they did not have a good grasp of the of English language if any at all And so yes, this was often a, a case, but the Canadian army at this point was taking 15 year olds who would lie and say they were 19 kind of thing. So um, the Canadian army was not being picky in terms of um, Okay, well, you're not so good at English. You don't really speak English at all. That's okay. You'll learn it 
come on in. And mm. uh, yeah, so this was certainly an experience for, for, for quite a few. We, we talked uh, uh, about, you know, entire communities lo losing their men. I mean, not losing, but them going off, mm -hmm. off to war. And I want to spend some time talking to you about what's going on on the home front. As many Aboriginal Canadian men are over fighting in Europe, um, what is happening in Aboriginal communities in Canada while many of their men are off in Europe fighting? Well, they're, they're, they're facing their own much quieter war themselves. And again, the residential schools were just kicking into gear, uh, hardcore kind of thing there. Um, this was become, you know, it was said at the time, in order to save the Indian, we must kill, uh, in order to save the man, we must kill the Indian. Um, mm -hmm. you know, this was a popular expression being bandied about. Um, and so they were facing a much more, uh, a quieter, but much more desperate war in their own way on, on, on reserves. Uh, across our country, just uh, you know, the the sheer fact of imagine your your small child being ripped from your arms, um, uh, being taken away from you, uh, to some st scary institution far away, um, and you not having any contact with that child anymore, that that in itself is is is, is a trauma that that is going to take many generations for us to continue to get over. And I'm talking about now contemporarily, but you can imagine then when when this is residential schools right in the right in the you know the fervor to kill the Indian, to save the man, to mm. save the child uh, was, was very loud uh, in Canada at the time. And, and as that experience, that, that troubling experience is going on, and it's known to be troubling as it's going on, are Aboriginal Canadians who are at home contributing to, to the Great War effort? Well, I can't speak for all, but certainly, yes. Uh, uh, women sewing and, and knitting, you know, there's all kinds of stories of, of reserves banding together and, and with their meager resources, sending whatever they could uh, off to the, to the front lines, uh, to, you know, to the army to bring to the front lines. Uh, all kinds of stories of women making moccasins for their soldiers at, uh, away, f knitting, sewing, um, everything that they could do. Just, you know, and again, I can't speak for all. Uh, communities, but certainly the communities I've read about, uh, um, very, very high-pitched kind of concern for their for their people mm -hmm. away and, and, and their desire to help them in any way they could. You talked about um, Aboriginal soldiers going off to war, g getting promises from the Canadian government, come when you come back, we'll give you land, and you listed a number of other things. I mean, what benefits did they actually did they actually meet, get? Were those promises kept? Zero, <laughs> unfortunately. Nothing that I can find. All the promises that were made, were not, none were kept. Um, they were back to being wards of the state again. Look at how Peggy Macabo was treated when he returned home and not even allowed to get a loan um, uh, to, to, to try his hand at raising a few horses. Uh, so no, nothing was, no, 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 uh, no promise was kept. Um, but then again, World War II rolls around and guess what happens again? First Nations men again, in huge numbers, volunteer for a country, again, promises being made um, that were not kept. Uh, but still, you know, the First Nations person is a resilient person is how I, I like to look at it and somebody who's very patient. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it, was, it, it was tough. Our government, it was act disgracefully at the mm. time. And, and you know, you say First Nations people are resilient and patient, but I can't imagine this didn't have an effect in, in, on shaping the relationship between uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. You go off, you fight a war, you come, you promise things, you come back, you get none of them. I mean, what's the sort of longer lasting effect between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians? Well, what it did, what I, you know, the positive thing I see is that it forced uh, Aboriginal people to band together after the First World War. Peggy Magabo got so frustrated and angry that he ran for chief of his reserve and won and became chief for many, many years thereafter. Not only did he become chief of his reserve, he started talking to other chiefs across the country and said, we need to form our own alliance. We need to, we need to create our own um, uh, structure of government federally. And so that's what he did, along with a number of other chiefs. He created what is basically now the Assembly of First Nations. He was the first grand chief of, of of this alliance of Indians, uh, of, of different tribes across Canada. And so, you know, he took something, he could have, you know, just stewed and, and, and become very negative and, and basically lived a quiet life of desperation, but instead he rose above and he did something great. And, and you know, that speaks to the spirit of, of our First Nations in our country in such a strong way. And, and so, you know, from the most negative jaws of defeat, he, he grasped something really beautiful and, and, and created something that I think is a really, um, 
in the world we don't we don't have this mm. kind of thing this this assembly of first nations across uh, across a large country you don't have in the united states really you know not in the way that we have it in canada um and i haven't seen in other countries either you know, so, so the legacy is, is partially political, if we can put it that way. There, there's yeah, the Assembly absolutely. of First yeah. Nations, and as we, you know, celebrate or mark a, a century since the First World War, many historians look at it as, that, as obviously being having such a deep impact on, on really shaping Canadian identity. How do you see uh, the First World War shaping Aboriginal identity? Well, again, I think you know this idea that despite being treated so horribly by the colonizer, despite being like, and I'm talking, when I say horribly, I'm not using that word lightly. I'm, I, again, I'm talking about the residential school system, I'm talking about the, 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 the theft of, of language, of culture, of children. Um, despite all this, we still stood up and did what was right. We stood up and did what we believe was right. You know, the Haudenosaunee people, for example, uh, refused to fight for Canada. <laughs> they, they, they said, we're going to fight for uh, the King of England and the Queen of England. You know, we're going to fight for England. And so this idea of, of, of deep um, um, uh, alliance, this idea of a, a very deep, we, we do not forget our, our allies. We, we will never uh, not help our allies out, uh, was a very strong um, sentiment, I think, across nations, mm -hmm. across Canada. And uh, so this is, I think this is one of the great kind of you know, just as Vimy Ridge helped to shape, um, you know, Canada as a country, the four divisions coming together for the first time and winning the first major battle of World War One, um, the quiet uh, battles that were being fought across these communities, First Nations communities in Canada, uh, showed, you know, that we, we are not people who are going to say no to you, mm. even though you treat us so poorly. I know it's been almost a decade, well, it's probably more than a decade since you since you wrote Three Day Road, but mm -hmm. as we're sort of, you know, this this summer looking back at the First World War, what, how, how, what to what extent do you think Canada, um, at, we Canadians, are, are recognizing the contributions of, of First Nations soldiers and, and the role that they played in the First World War? I think a lot more uh, than we used to, which is really great. And again, I'm not, I'm not taking uh, I'm not saying that it's because of Three Day Road or, you know, or my writing at all, but I think that Canadians just over the last 10, 15 years have really begun to understand that our First Nations people are not just this outlying aspect of our society, this, this shadow in our society, that, these are, these, that we are a people who are an incredibly uh, important um, piece of the fabric of, of this country, uh, if not the foundational fabric of this country. And, and you know, I think Canadians are realizing that more and more, and 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 they're hungry for these stories. Three Day Road continues to sell well. You know, I'm 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 couldn't be more thrilled as a writer that almost ten years later, this book continues to be taught in schools and people are still reading it, and that makes me very proud that I, my small contribution is to shine mm -hmm. some light on some dark corners that we needed a light mm -hmm. shone on because they're they're very beautiful corners and, and complex corners and, and of as, our culture. As you reflect. Um, on a hundred years ago and the, and the contributions of Canadian Aboriginal soldiers or Aboriginal soldiers to the Canadian effort. What's the legacy, Joseph Wood, and what do you want Canadians to remember or specifically know about what First Nations did for our country at that time? The per capita First Nations soldiers volunteered at greater numbers than any other uh, population in our country, despite uh, the very grievous way they had been treated and continue to be treated after the war and despite the promises that were made and broken, uh, continue to do so throughout our country's history, both in wartime and in peace. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, that, that's something really important, I think, that we have to understand is that uh, um, so many First Nations people put everything on the line, their lives included, uh, to, to better a place, to better a country that often refused to even consider them fully formed humans, you know, that they were just wards of the state. Mm. Joseph Wooden, thank you. I, I think, again, as, as we look back a hundred years, um, for all of us Canadians, this is a good reminder of what our um, Aboriginal Canadians did for us a hundred years ago. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Pia. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.